Hello, welcome to Cinema Savvy and welcome back to Retro Reviews. We've finally made it to the third one, the one that we're all excited to talk about today. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been covering the Beverly Hills Cop trilogy and we are here at the third one, uh, the John Landis directed 1994 Beverly Hills Cop 3. Um, I'm not going to lie, I was dreading this one, but uh, we are here to finish it off strong today. Um, this is a film that I watched ages ago and I rewatched yesterday for this review. And uh, you're new to it, but before we get to that, we'll just go over the socials real quick. Absolutely, guys. So, as we always say, we don't know when we're going to do some of our videos. Some of our videos are planned in advance, like this. We are pre-recording this, of course. However, we will still be around for all your comments at hand. So do comment below your thoughts, not just on Beverly Hills Cop 3, but also your thoughts on the trilogy. Do you want a fourth one? We're going to get into some of that stuff. So comment along with us. And if you enjoy this stuff, if you've been liking our Eddie Murphy films, then you obviously you are very aware that there is a new Eddie Murphy film coming out uh, at the end of next week, surprising, going very quick. So stick around, do subscribe if you want to see more of our content. And, of course, the best way to find out what we're going to be doing is, of course, social media, which is Facebook Cinema Savvy, Twitter at Cinema underscore Savvy, back on letterbox.com slash Cinema Savvy, and we have a link to our TV public store in the description below. And we've got a lot of other stuff coming to the channel, so do get us on the socials to find out what's going to be best for you absolutely um so where do we even start with this one um a film that should never have been made really even eddie murphy didn't want this film to be made i guess what we'll do is before we go into it i'll go over the plot for anyone that um fortunately hasn't seen this film uh so beverly hills cop 3 axel foley while investigating a car theft ring comes across some something much bigger than that the same men who killed his boss are running a counterfeit money ring out of a theme park in los angeles um, this was a very strange animal, this film, because um, basically the collection that I've got is the trilogy on DVD, um, all the films, and I think I watched the first, I remember watching the first two on TV, but I never watched the third one. For whatever reason, it was either not on TV, you know, or I just missed it whenever it was on. So I just got the trilogy box set, was really excited to get to the third one, knew nothing about it, didn't know about its reputation or anything, and I absolutely hated it. When, when I watched it the first time and I only ever watched it that once the first two I'd go back to every now and then if they were on TV you know I'd catch them whenever uh, and I love those first two films they're some of my favorite films from the 80s and I never went back to this one uh, for very good reasons uh, this I think pretty much review wise has been slated across the board um, I did a bit more digging though we'll get into the behind the scenes on this later because this was again a really troubled production uh, it's amazing that this got made but I think my biggest takeaway from it, if I'm just sort of like going to give my initial opinions and really the vibe that I get from watching it, it feels like a film that no one wants to make. Even every actor in there, Eddie Murphy just seems bored. He, it's like he doesn't want to be there. You read about the film and he said quite openly that he didn't want to come back for this film. He thought that, and maybe I kind of agree with him here. I'm going to bring up this quote real quick that he said um, regarding this film. Um and this was, quote, in 1989, he stated this. So this was, you know, way before the film came. This was five years before Beverly Hills Cop 3 was made. There's no reason to do it. I don't need the money. And it's not going to break the. It's not going to break any new ground. How often can you have Axel Foley talk fast and get into a place he doesn't belong? But these motherfuckers are developing scripts for it. They're in pre-production. The only reason to do a Cop 3 is to beat the bank. And Paramount ain't going to write no check as big as I want to do something like that. In fact, if I do a Cop 3, you can safely bet, oh, he must have got a lot of money and that was his quote that he did in 1989 so yeah th this wasn't a passion project for anyone and it really shows um it doesn't have the same wit it doesn't have the same charm it doesn't have the same energy and it just i pitched this to you as it felt very kiddy and i watched it again and it, it does in some aspects and I, I think that's more so from there are two very different kinds of eddie murphy there's the 80s eddie murphy you know, the stand-up stuff, the raw delivery, uh, the much more adult jokes and the swearing. And then you've got the 90s Eddie Murphy. And I like elements of both. You've got Nutty Professor. You, man you mentioned, like, Daddy Daycare. This definitely feels more 90s Eddie Murphy through this one. Yeah, that, that was my biggest takeaway. The film sort of started and the opening scene was like, okay, stake out. And then they start singing and, and dancing. And yeah. I'm... I'm just sat there really politely like, what the fuck is going on? Um, not even as a Beverly Hills cop film, not even as a comedy. I was there like, what is happening on screen? I don't really get it. I don't know why. I don't know how, but it is. And 
that was a sign of things to come. Uh, and then you, I'm glad you mentioned that sort of 80s, 90s stuff because when you get to the theme park stuff, it's, I mean, it's bad, but it's not as bad as I had anticipations going into it. But it was very strange because I know that 90s, you know, the Daddy Daker one that we said, the Naughty Professor, and it feels like, not, not like a Kyler Ren quote, but it's the pull of the, in five years' time, this is this could easily be an Eddie Murphy comedy, him and dressed up as an elephant, him at a theme park with a family and stuff. But it's trying to slowly get to that whilst he's still a detective in a trilogy, which is still pretty violent and, and has darker themes and stuff. And there's this uh, there's a strange sort of um, surreal setting to it all where the location and plot points don't, really go hand in hand with the story at stake even the counterfeit money stuff why is that set at a theme park i mm. get it wanted to be different but some things just don't add up and it and it makes it a horrible amalgamation of events and it just kind of leaves you there's a great moment you messaged me last night as well when one of the actors and we'll get to the actors too because a couple of them don't chose not to come back i think <laughs> probably um you know in a character can someone just turn that fucking song off and that that was that was a great line. There's probably two two great lines in the film. The second one's uh, Eddie Murphy pretending to be the dead guy on the floor. That was quite funny. Mm-hmm. Um, but aside from that, there's just nothing to it. And you mentioned as well the money. So he got paid 15 million for this. Uh, and we know in the sort of late 80s, 90s, the sort of actors, you know, the the leading star did always make that money. I think 90s was when it spiraled up into insane amounts for lead actors. And then it sort of dropped in the. I want to mm-hmm. say like. Early, to, I, I'm not saying the Marvel effect, but certainly in that sort of latter half of the noughties, when sort of multi picture contracts started happening, the actor's salaries drops. You still get, still get one, one once in a while. You get your Robert Downey Juniors and stuff, but it was you could tell that no one wanted to be there, and it's really sad. Look, looking back at this, the whole point of these reviews, we're looking back at older films, films we've not seen, and it's that sort of one, two, three. That could you imagine being a fan in the nineties, knowing that he's coming back for a third one? You go and you see this. And it's kind of like why, and you know, you wouldn't have access to the internet back then to look up those quotes and stuff Eddie Murphy said about the film, and it shows. And I think some of the stuff I was reading, which I think are some of the issues that Eddie Murphy didn't want it to be funny. He wanted the he wanted Axel Foley to be more mature. He wanted him to settle down and just be a cop. And I'm kind of like, well, is that because you can't be asked to do the comedy, or is that because you generally just can't be asked for the character, or is it a bit of both? And I think the issues stem across the entire film. It, it's just a cash grab, and it's a shame. And I think we'll talk about Beverly Hills Got 4 later on, but this might be another Indiana Jones 4 where there's a future film being made only because they don't want the last one to be the final one. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you mentioned there about um, Eddie Murphy not wanting it to be a comedy or downplaying the comedy more with the role, saying that Axel's moved on. You know, he he's grown as a character and... Um, he'd worked with the director before on two previous films. He'd worked with him on a come into America and trade in places. So, um, I- I'm guessing, you know, obviously if he's come back for multiple films, they have like a good working relationship. And there was an interview with John Landis and, you know, he's, he's really respectful of Eddie Murphy and says that he was always a professional on set, but there was a clash there. It was like John Landis was pushing it more towards that comedic route or trying to find scenarios for him to go into that comedy side and Eddie Murphy would always try and find a way to skirt around it and try and avoid it as much as possible. There are also um, like rumors and reports that at the time Eddie Murphy was depressed. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I know that that's a report out there as well. And that kind of showed in his performance, or maybe he just really didn't want to be there and was just sleepwalking his way through it. But I mean, if you're getting paid 15 mil to come back and do a film, give it your all. Uh, And uh, it really honestly doesn't seem like he's doing that in this film. And it's a shame. And I think that's ultimately where this film falters. I mean, it has a lot of problems. Um, It jumps the shark in many ways. Um, You mentioned the song and dance number at the beginning. If you look at the openings to the other films, you had the the great um, truck chase at the beginning of one. How did two open again? I'm I'm forgetting the opening of two. That had something similar as well, didn't it? It had some kind of... Was it a follow-up? It was was the bank robbery, wasn't it? It was the the bank robbery with, uh, with Bridget Nielsen. Um... And then in this one, it's, yeah, it's dancing to a, a Diana Ross song. Great song, but um, it, it just doesn't feel in keeping. It's that clash of tone. In, in some respects, you do get the shootouts. You do get, you know, bullet wounds and everything like that. But then you do have, like, the really sort of kiddie comedy in the situations. But I think that inherently why I don't like this film is that 
it feels like so many of the familiar elements are just taken out of it or just completely missing, or you've got the same actors there, the same characters, but they just act in a completely different way. They may as well be different characters. Chief among them, Eddie Murphy. I'm not going to rag on Eddie Murphy much longer than after this point, but that was the character. The character was going into all of these situations, playing these characters, playing these different personalities in order to get into somewhere or get some evidence or get some information. Those scenarios were the best things for me. In, in the first two films, we talked about the actual overall plots you don't really care about in the Beverly Hills Cop films. And I stand by that. You care about the dynamic of the characters, the humor and the situations. And he doesn't really have any of those moments in this. He tries to get into the theme park, but it's not like he's playing a character or anything. He just tries to get into the theme park. You have like the goons that come behind him and then he just pays to get in. But it's not like he's trying to create a persona or anything in order to get into a situation so all that elements removed from it um i don't even think you see him laugh at many points during this film he seems very stoic and very miserable um and then you've got the core three right you had rosewood and taggart now you do have rosewood back for this and um the actor himself um oh god what's his name uh judge reinhold hated this film he says he yeah. hated it but I will say that Billy Rosewood is the only character that across this whole trilogy does have some kind of arc. And, and this is where I'm torn on his character because I love him when he's the, the plucky sort of green cup, the, the naive one of the three, especially in the first film. And I think that's why I prefer the first film. You've got the wild card, which is Axel. You've got Taggart, who's the by the book, old school senior cop. And then you've got the, the younger cop who's probably like new to the job. And then in the second one, Billy almost became like Clint Eastwood at the end when he was in like the duster jacket with the with the twin guns and became a bit more badass at the end, which was a nice sort of continuation for him. And then in this one, Taggart didn't come back for this. Uh, he got out while the getting was good when he read the script. Uh, you don't have Bogomil either as the, um, the police chief, the boss. But um, Billy in this, he doesn't have any of those qualities. He doesn't have the same dynamic. He doesn't have the same back and forth or humor because he has fundamentally changed his character. Now you could argue that that's good, that there is a character that does progress over the trilogy, but I think certain films, certain franchises and series, and I think this being included when you get a winning formula, you kind of need to cling on to that formula and you can't change the core components too much. It's not a story like, you know, any of your big franchises or trilogies, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, or anything like that, any kind of franchise where you can have character development and you can have growth and characters can change. Usually with comedies or especially like buddy cop films, you need to keep the components where they are. If you start changing things, if characters don't act in a certain way, you lose what made that dynamic special from the original. Yeah, and this is my problem with it, is that if Eddie Murphy hadn't have come back, we wouldn't have this discussion, right? The film wouldn't be yeah. made. And it's a shame that he still came back, even though his other cast members came back. I'm not going to harp on him too much because we already know he said he didn't need the money, but he wanted a hell of a lot of money to, to come back and do it, which I think says a lot at the exact same time. But no one works that's come as replacements. Even the villains don't work. There's something not even sinister about them, but there's just something like these are boring villains and I do like the second one, obviously, quite a lot. And I Judge, um, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of him in both films. I remember saying that certainly I didn't like how weird he got in the second one. Mm. And in the third one, it, it just felt cashed in. And I think when you're certainly with comedy sequels, if there's already someone that you're not too keen on in one film, let alone two, bringing them in for the awful third film well, was even not worse, but it's kind of like, you can tell he doesn't want to be there, and he acts like that. And near the end, when everyone's getting massacred in the shootout, and then they're all alive as well, even stuff like that, just the joke doesn't land of them all being shot and like, ha, ah, they've been shot. And even that's if it's, you know, we're as tired as they are watching it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, that's that's my issue that when you get to the end, he's like, Christ, like, okay, I can finally turn this off now, too. And it's just this horrible juxtaposition. And the sad thing is, is that. I don't know obviously what had, what the rest process was, but why would you bring in another new character to try and be an, an amalgamation of someone that's already come and gone? Exactly. And yeah, the, thought, Taggart, the, ta the Taggart stand in, right? It's, yeah, uh, let me and, get his name. Hector Elizondo, uh, John Flint. I don't even remember his name from the film. Yeah, and he's I, clearly meant to be Taggart. And I thought he was going to be a villain. I thought he was going to 
try and kill them or do something, but he doesn't even have that. He's genuinely just a, a Taggart carbon copy, and it, yeah. it's just so it's just lame to watch. I hate using the word lame, but it's just you know it's not really the actor's fault. You're not no actor's going to say no to being well. No actor that's not already been on Beverly Hills Cop's going to say no to being in Beverly Hills Cop mm. to be in a in a supporting role with Eddie Murphy, but it just leaves a nasty sting in my mouth and. It's really sad looking back at just how pathetic the entire thing is because you know there's a good director that's directing it and it's not his probably I don't know if it's his worst one I'm not seen all of his films but I'd imagine it's quite low down his list of, of his, some of his accomplishments and it just feels wrong mm-hmm. and leaning back into talking about a fourth one they they need it to try and I don't even want to say eradicate this but you know how do you move on from this if you've butchered something this bad what is the what is the concept to move past it? Is it a passing joke? Is it, do they want to do this or are we going to get history repeating ourselves? It leaves us kind of questions. It's a shame because it shouldn't, you don't get many great comedy trilogies. I think mm-hmm. some of them tend, because the problem with comedy is that they try not to stop it until it's, it's finished until it loses. Such an, you can say they're big franchises. You can say they're action films, but comedy is more so than anything. You have one film that works. The second film works. The third don't, you ain't going to get a fourth. Have a third film that works, they'll still make a fourth one. And that's when you have to give credit to stuff like Jump Street, where they know, you know, comedy sequels aren't great. We're going to do one sequel, and then we're going to write it in a unique way where we basically can't do another sequel unless it's Men in Black, mm. uh, which it should have been, which it wasn't. Again, Men in Black, another one, kept getting sequels, eventually got a trilogy. Third one wasn't too bad. It's mainly how bad the second one was. And then you get Men in Black International just to, to re kill that franchise. And it's it's just a shame, and it, it feels like sort of merciless cash grabs. And I don't know. I've just got I've had a pretty sour taste in my mouth since watching this yesterday. Yeah, it's just the tones all over the place with this one as well. It feels like a film that doesn't really know what it wants to be. Um, you open with the death of um, oh god, what's his name? Let me just get his name real quick. Uh, Inspector Douglas Todd, um, Jill Hill's character, the boss. Uh, could be a really impactful moment, you know, a character that we've seen in, in the first three getting killed off at the beginning. That seems to be a running thing with these films. Always someone dies or gets injured. Um, you know, you had um, Bogomil in the second one. You had his best friend in the first one. You have his boss in this one. Um, so you've got that sort of more darker side to it. And then you just have the really weird kitty. Uh, the bit where he rescues the kids from the Ferris wheel. Why was that in the film? Some impressive yeah. stunt work. Watching that, I was I was impressed with like the parkouring and how they filmed that. But there the is screen, some the, awful, the green screen's terrible though in some of the close ups. Yeah. So bad, awfully bad. And the poster is so misleading as well. There's this roller coaster, and that's why I said to you, um, I was trying to remember some things um, about this film from watching it years and years ago. Whenever I got the DVD, and I said all I remember is some kind of sci-fi gun, and we'll get onto that in a minute. And a roller coaster. And I was thinking of the poster. There is no roller coaster in this film. It's a Ferris wheel. And then there's like the indoor, I, I you can't even call that a roller coaster, really. It's like a I think it was filmed at Universal Studios, wasn't it? It was one of like the rides they have there, I think. Um, and that's it. And that's your great set piece. And it feels really cheap. This was done on a budget of 70 mil. Um, and that was a point of contention as well, was the budget, because I know the studio. They were going over budget and they were putting a lot of money into this and um, they cut it back by 20 mil. I think the budget was going to be 50. Could it even more? I I think eventually they settled on 70 mil. Eventually you had producers pulling out of it. I think Bruckheimer got out of there fairly early on. They had to bring in someone else as well. Um, And even just like coming up with a story for this thing. So I remember when we did our Beverly Hills Cop 2 review, I read that the idea for the sequel was to go to Europe. It was going to be London or Paris or something like that. And they were going to set it there. And Eddie Murphy didn't want to take it out of the U S he didn't want it to go in that direction. They brought that idea up again for this one. They wanted to go to London. I think there were, there was rumors that Axel was going to meet up with like a Scotland Yard police investigator played by John Cleese. There was rumors that he was going to pair up with Sean Connery in a version as well. Um, so they were dead set on that idea, and then obviously it became this one. But can you remember which film? After you watched this film, you compared this to another film that we've already covered on the channel uh, in retro reviews. You said it kind of gave you those vibes. Can you remember which film that was? You said in terms of the structure and how it played out for you. Can you remember? I can't, I, I used two. I, I can remember saying Die Hard, but I've already forgotten the second one. Um, well, uh, uh, you're not even far wrong with Die Hard. You said Commando as well. 
Now, both ah, of those yeah. films, Commando oh, and oh, Die Hard oh, and Die Hard 2, were written by Stephen E. D'Souza, and he wrote the screenplay for this film as well. So that's interesting that you drew those parallels with it if you didn't know who wrote it. Um, yeah. It is a fall from grace, though, going from Commando and Die Hard and Die Hard 2 to this. And looking at um, Sousa's credits after that, he, man, that, that guy had it all. And then he hit a point, um, the Flintstones film, which I enjoyed as a kid. But, you know, in terms of writing, not that great. Uh, Street Fighter, the original Judge Dredd, to Laura Croft, Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life. That guy just dropped off a cliff in terms of his writing. And, and this one, obviously, as well. Um, so I don't know if there were multiple drafts of the script and he sort of came in last minute and had to cobble something together. If that case, fair play. If he had a lot of time to write this, then he did not do a good job of this. And that really shocks me considering he did those greater action films as well. Yeah, it, it's strange because it they're like the 80s films and it's like, well, here we are in the mid-90s. And it doesn't it doesn't even feel like mid-90s. It feels this like weird amalgamation of events. And the Die Hard thing was the... I don't know what his approach is, but when we spoke about Commando, I think we actually spoke about Die Hard too. He was saying mm -hmm. that here's the guy trying to get back with his family vibe, and here's this specific setting that he has to do to get to her. And I'd say this one definitely feels more like Die Hard than Commando, sort of thinking about sort of the day after. So let's take this story, let's take the action set piece, and let's put it in a public location. Mm -hmm. Where can we put it where you'd expect people to be that you could essentially set a film that's not 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 been done before, but it's going to be different. And it's that okay, Die Hard went for an office block on Christmas Eve, brilliant. Here, let's do a theme park because I right okay, you know that a theme park could work. Oh, but it's about like dancing bears and elephants, and there's an owner that everyone loves who's like a local hero, and it's it's kid orientated. I'm just kind of sat there like this. It's kind of like a stupid sort of B Tech diehard, isn't it? Politely put, mm. it's that let's go for the deep action set pieces at the theme park. And what kind of threw me more was that when you get to the end of the film, you have the final gunfight. You kind of sit there really awkwardly put, like, why is this? Why, why, like, why a theme park? Why are you having these over the top, insane deaths at a theme park? And it doesn't mean that okay, you know, the opening scene has some pretty savage executions. The first two films, we can't, I remember saying certainly uh, not Die Hard one in a Beverly Hills Cop one that it threw me some of the action, uh, mm -hmm. how sort of violent it got at the end, and it's like they were trying to do that again, but it was just so out of focus and out of touch that none of that landed as well. It just made it look even more awkward and added in with the terrible sci-fi gun. It's just a, a combination that didn't work. Should we talk about Surge? Uh, I, I was going to bring him up. I think that's a good segue. So love yeah. Surge's character in the first one in. One scene, I believe, very, very short scene, but the impact of that character and it's it, it's a very memorable scene. It's a very funny scene with those two sort of like improv off each other. So they brought Bronson Pinchot back for this and his character is so obnoxiously annoying in this film. Yeah. It's like when you have that lightning in a bottle character that might only be in it for like a minute less than that, but they leave that impact and they work for that small part of the character and it's memorable but then they just double down on that and they make him way more flamboyant and way more stereotypical and way more over the top than he was in the first film. And again, the joke doesn't land. So he was working the front desk in a, in an art dealership and now he's making weapon. He's basically like Q from James Bond in this. He's made all of these gadgets in order to look fashionable as you for like home defense. And obviously they all get bought up in the final fight where they get put into use, but it's so over the top. He's got this, yeah, this gun that plays music and it does this and it's, what can't this gun do? It feels like something completely out of a different film. This is this is no longer Beverly Hills Cop. I was watching this film last night and I, I was sort of like voice messaging you and it got to that scene and I had to keep stopping my message because something stupid was happening in the film and I forgot how stupid it gets. Uh, I love the character of Serge, but way too over the top in this and it, it is that cl clash of tone. There are it tries to have it both ways. There are moments where, especially the intro, it tries to you know it tries to go into that more gritty take, like the first two were. And I actually really like that about the first two. I know that you felt that two felt more cohesive as a film, and I can see that. You know, you didn't really care for the moments where it was trying to be a comedy, but then it was also like a hard boiled action film. I quite liked that grittiness to it. I think that was what I found very attractive about the first two films. This one, none of that. 
and it's just full of those stupid gags and it just does it doesn't feel in keeping but then when you do get kind of a bit at the end and that did kind of take me out of it as well where they are all shot up in a really horrible way like um rosewood walks out covered in blood like he gets shot whole i think he gets shot so hard he goes flying across the room doesn't he into a wall or something to the point where i was like oh shit does he die in this film but it comes out you've got to have the happy ending and they're all in wheelchairs and all bandaged up and I don't know. Yeah, in that ending, I'm trying to think, would that have worked in the first two films maybe? Because it does have more of that harder edge to it if they'd have ended a scene where it's like, I need medical attention. But even then, it's just, it's weird. It's like, these guys look like they're fatally injured and about to die. Rosewood collapses face first in a pool of his own blood and it's like they're making a joke about it. So it, yeah. it's the tone for me. It's just way off. So way and off. And then, then it transitions to the episode one uh, final scene with the... Yeah. I, was, I don't know if I mentioned that. All I could think was the ending of Phantom Menace. It was mm -hmm. strange. It was like, and now here's an Axel Fox, and they're all there in their like wheelchairs and everything. They're all wounded, but they're all like laughing and stuff. I'm, it's not like a joke. Like, can you find this funny? Um, no, I don't. Um, I don't know if it was meant to be a big trivial trilogy ending. It just didn't work. The ending was strange, weird, bizarre. And then you're getting like Eddie Murphy wheeled off with a love interest that no one cares about either. Right. Um, so, Speaking of Star Wars, what did you think to the uh, the George Lucas cameo in this film? Uh, this was amazing. I didn't clock it. Uh, <laughs> maybe it shows how little I was paying attention. It's him and Ray Harryhausen, isn't it? I didn't yeah. notice it until afterwards. And I was just kind of sat there like, I want to see the footage of George Lucas being asked to come on Beverly Hills Cop for a day. It's probably in the area. He probably asked him as a favour. He's like, yeah, sure, why not? But it's um, another, again, it's, it's just a sad disappointment. It's the music as well. So, um you can tell we're in the 90s with this soundtrack. Um, we do get a reprise of the Axel Foley theme or Axel F. Yeah. Uh, most of the time it's either played by a brass band or it's got like this hip hop 90s dance backing beat to it. So the composer didn't come back for this one. This The music to this one was done by Niall Rogers and um, Harold Faltermeyer. I'm glad they did use the, the main theme still because that is that is Beverly Hills Cop, that theme. Um so I'm I'm glad they reprised that, but the rest of the music's just neither here or there, you know. But at least they did sort of like keep that iconic theme, but it doesn't hit the same. It it, it just and I, I think that's maybe a fault of well, we're into the '90s now. The the song that was so fundamentally quintessentially '80s of the synthesizer that ain't going to probably work in '90s. So add the dance beat to it, but you just don't care about the film. It feels like I don't know. Is Beverly Hills Cop a film that's a product of its time? I don't know, but I feel like that '80s setting is so quintessential to that film and i guess you know if we're talking about the future of this franchise um, apparently a fourth film is greenlit there was the failed tv show that never saw the light of day i don't know based on eddie murphy's comments with this film in that he wanted to take it in a more serious direction he wanted Fo um, axel foley to grow he didn't want to be the same wisecracking guy going into all these situations that makes me kind of worried for a beverly hills cop 4 especially after all this time because for me, if you if you do want to sort of resurrect this franchise, you need a back to basics approach and you need to go back to what fundamentally made Axel Foley a great character from those first couple of films. If he stems away from that and he wants to go down more of like a serious action route, isn't going to work. It's, it's what Sylvester Stallone wanted to do. Originally, he wanted to be like a serious cop drama. They said, no, it's not going to work. We need this comedic element to it. And I thought it worked beautifully they kind of got away from that in the third one or the humor they did have didn't work and it didn't hit the same levels as the first two did. So I don't know what direction he'd take it, but judging from the trailers for coming to America too, it looks like he's sort of, <clears throat> he's cemented himself back into that comedic role. Uh, I loved him in Dolomite is my name as well. That was kind of almost a return to form for Eddie Murphy after going quiet for all those years. So it depends how they handle it. I would love to see another one if done right, but I don't know. Do you think maybe the ship has sailed on the Beverly Hills Cop franchise after this one? This is my this is my issue is that because we've not seen Coming to America two yet. Um, I if that's great, I wouldn't have an objection for them saying you know he's had Dolomite's my name, but Eddie Murphy came back to that and it was great. Got a good nomination. Went back to SNL. I think won an Emmy for best guest supporting host. One of his great returns. And then he was signed on for a world tour and COVID hit. And we haven't seen that stand-up. It's not happened yet. The tour's not happened yet. So it's very much, okay, the comeback's still happening. It's in progress. And then it's coming to America too. And Corona also delayed that. And we're in this really unique situation now where 
And dependent on what happens, I think we're coming to America, I think we'll find out very soon if we're going to get that Beverly Hills Cup for. Is it that Harrison Ford revisiting the franchises yeah, to retire the characters? Mm-hmm. It's, is that really polite? And I want Eddie Murphy to do well because he was great in Dolomite. I think it was quite a personal film. Then he dedicated it to his brothers. So there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff with that. But I, right now, after watching three, I wouldn't want a fourth one. Mm-hmm. But then if Dolomite's great. And if coming to America is great, then I'll say, you know what? Let him have it. Don't know the context of his involvement in the production. I think whichever director would be told you're doing Beverly Hills Cop 4, they're going to make sure that they sort of do it good rather than a, a sort of soulless cash-in. So I'm in this very sort of, not complex, but unique situation with it where I'm not really sure what I want. Yeah, no, I'm exactly the same. Um, I guess I, I don't know when it's planned to come out. I know it's greenlit. I don't know if Netflix have got rights to it. I, I've seen conflicting things about it, but... um. I'll give it a chance when it comes out. Um, you know, I'm, I've, I've watched the first three in the franchise, right? In for a penny, in for a pound at that point of the fourth film's coming out. But um, if I'm going to give my overall opinions on not just this film, but the franchise as a whole, I do love the Beverly Hills Cop films, specifically just the first two. If I'm ever watching them, I'll always watch the first two. I'll never go to the third one. I don't know if I'll ever go back to this film, in all honesty. Now we've covered it on the channel. Now we've finally talked about it. We can we can put a pin in the Beverly Hills Cop trilogy. Uh, you can cross them off your list. You've finally seen the films. Uh, and we can move on to new territory as well. So would thoroughly recommend the first two, um, especially the first one to me is my favourite of the trilogy. Um, it just captures Eddie Murphy at that the early part of his career. Um, he was quick, he was witty, he was sharp. Everything came together for it. Um, and the second one's decent too. But this third one, just avoid this one. If, if you're watching the series, you may as well watch it just to say you've seen them all. But honestly, this one is it, so night and day different compared to the first two. Um, I, I don't know. What, what's your sort of overall takeaway on the trilogy? Yeah, it, it's a weird one. It's I wouldn't ever come back to the third one. If you've sat through the end of it, then you'll know by now that we're not fans of it. But <laughs> I would say watch them as a double bill. Uh, I've been treating back to back with one another like in the same night or like an old school type thing. Mm-hmm. That'd be quite fun. It is great seeing sort of eighties Eddie Murphy when he's got that. And, and it's, it's what you said, it's night and day. You look at the first one, how quick he is with the dialogue, with the comedy, with the actions, how he's talking with them. And then the third one, I think you get his laugh once right at the yeah. end. It's, yeah. it's those little things that say like, this is, this is honestly just a slap in the face. So avoid this one at all costs. Um, I still think my second, the second one is my favorite. Again, when you like both of the first two, it's kind of not like Star Wars, but you know when it's like pick a favorite when you sort of do like them equally, it, it's down to that selective tissue. It's I don't think there's one that stands out so much better than the other. Um, so I recommend the others absolutely must watches, but this one not so much. Just just get get out of the system and uh, avoid it if possible. But if you have seen, if you do like it, then we'd want to probably hear that from you. Why do you like this film? Uh, I'd be very curious to know because. There's just no payoffs for things that were done in the other films. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think that's a good segue. We've said everything we can on this film, so uh, we want to open it up to you guys now. Let us know what you think of Beverly Hills Cop 3, or the franchise and the trilogy as a whole. Um, Favourite moments. Uh, If you have any favourite moments from Beverly Hills Cop 3, do let us know and get your opinion across to us as well. Um, So we're going to be announcing now what we're doing for next week's Retro Review. So... We went with 90s Eddie Murphy with this one and uh, we felt like we needed to cleanse the palate and obviously you probably guessed it by now anyway. We've kind of teased this the last few weeks as to why we decided to do Beverly Hills Cop 3 was in anticipation for Coming to America 2. Uh, We're going to be jumping into the original. So another John Landis film from 1988, the romantic comedy film Coming to America. It's a film that I don't actually think I've seen beginning to end and I think both of us are in that situation. I think I've seen it on TV a couple of times, bits and pieces here and there. So that's going to be really good, not just to go back to that film and sort of officially cross that one off my list, but um, to get prepared for Coming to America 2, which we'll be reviewing later in the, on the channel as well. So um, that'll do it for us. We have a lot of other content coming out. So you know, if you're here, if you're here for the, the retro reviews, we have plenty of those. We keep those coming every single Tuesday at 8 p.m. GMT. But we have a lot of other things going on as well. Currently, as recording this, we've still got the One Division um, series coming out on Fridays. That's at 8 p.m. GMT. 
Um, they've been really fun to cover as well. A lot of good discussion topics in that. We get a lot of people in the comments sharing their thoughts as well. So please feel free to jump on for that one as well. We have the cinema, sorry, the Cinema Savvy Awards series, which we have on Thursday at 8 p.m. GMT. That's going to be going on for like the next um, nine to 10 weeks, um, taking us up to Oscar season. Each week we pick, pick a new category of the Oscars and we give our three nominees and our winner have a bit of a discussion. That's a good fun series to watch as well. And George, let's talk about your big one that you got coming out. Yeah, at the time of this coming out, um, we are a couple of episodes deep into recording the Infinity Tiger retrospective. It's myself as the host, bringing on guests every week, including calling Chris a guest, which is a very weird thing. Um, and it's it's looking back at the films on the um, phases one through to three, looking back at the Infinity Saga, covering everything from sort of character introductions to character finale points, characters that come back, didn't come back, scenes we love, scenes just like so much going on. There is an announcement video that is on our channel. By the time this goes up, that would have been yesterday, where I go over some of the details of that. And as mentioned, we've got a couple pre-recorded. There's a lot of them coming out every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday from next Monday, the 1st of March. It's going to be an insane series at the same time as doing the other stuff. So I'm looking forward to starting to release them to the public. But uh, it's going to be a long one, a long-winded one. But better viewing than Beverly Hills Cop 3. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I was even getting muddled there going through all of our content. So if you're getting a little bit muddled, best way to just get it all plain and simple is to go onto our social medias. We've got Facebook at Cinema Savvy, Twitter at Cinema underscore Savvy. If you want to have a look at what we've reviewed in a sort of like clear, clear easy way to see, we're on letterbox at dot com slash Cinema Savvy. And if you'd like to pick up any merch, we've got the T public link in the description down below. Um, there we'll have times of everything we've got coming and things that we've got scheduled and teases for future reviews. Um, so please feel free to check those out as well. That'll do it for our review on Beverly Hills Cop 3 and we'll see you guys on the next video.